Hello, everyone. We were asked to explain why the coronavirus vaccine might affect MS symptoms and what that implies in terms of MS disease activity. To understand this, I'd like to spend a few minutes just talking about how the nervous system is structured and how that is impacted by environmental changes and how that particular biology changes in the setting of MS. So first off, I am talking about the central nervous system, which includes the brain, the spinal cord, and the optic nerves. And they're called the central nervous system because they have two unique cell types that are not found anywhere else in the body. And this is not the neurons. Neurons are found in other organs. But in the central nervous system, they have a cell type called an oligodendrocyte, which is a cell that actually makes the myelin, which is the insulation material around the nerve fibers, and which is damaged in multiple sclerosis. Uh, the peripheral nerves use a different type of cell uh, to make myelin. The other cell type in the central nervous system that's unique is the astrocyte. And the astrocyte is a cell that creates a very special environment in the brain that allows nerve cells and oligodendrocytes to work optimally. It basically builds a cocoon around neurons and oligodendrocytes and regulates nutri nutrients, toxins, um, and other molecules in those areas so that the neurons and oligos work optimally. Now, the, because of that, those astrocytes, in general, the nervous system is relatively impervious to minor changes in the environment the person's in or in the microenvironment inside the person in terms of function. But in multiple sclerosis, both the astrocytes and the oligodendrocytes are damaged and often destroyed. And as a result, they expose the nerve fibers to uh, an environment that's not highly regulated and can be affected by changes in salt solutions, calcium, sodium, potassium levels, related to changes in diet, dehydration, et cetera. They're also exposed to other physical forces. And so they become sensitive to simple pressure uh, changes in weather. So weather front moving through will change that microenvironment in terms of how that nerve fiber works. Same is true for body temperature. So a rise in the internal temperature, even a very tiny one, a quarter of a degree or a half a degree, something you wouldn't be able to measure by using an oral thermometer can still affect those nerve fibers. And that's because the nerve fibers have little openings in them called channels that are allowing the salts, sodium, potassium, uh, and uh, calcium to move back and forth across that membrane. And that movement is the basis for the conduction of electrical signals. So when a uh, neuron receives input that causes it to depolarize, it then starts an electric current flowing down the nerve fiber where sodium and calcium is flowing in, into the cell and potassium and chloride are flowing out and particularly potassium. And each one of those salts as they move across are moving through a different opening, a different channel. So there's a potassium channel, sodium channel and a calcium channel. And these are physical structures. They look like little donuts that are in the membranes of the nerve fibers. And it turns out that the potassium channel actually changes in size based on temperature. It gets bigger when the body temperature goes up. That lets potassium flow out more briskly, whereas the sodium and the calcium channels don't really change very much, so they don't really increase in terms of the amount of sodium and, and calcium that flows into the nerve fiber. Now, that direction of flow is important because the sodium and calcium are the currents that actually uh, cause the electrical flow of the current down the nerve fiber. So that movement of potassium, excuse me, of calcium and sodium into the nerve fiber is the electrical gradient that moves down the nerve fiber and sends a signal onto the next nerve cell. Potassium flow from the inside out is the off signal. It's the rectifying current. So it actually reestablishes the normal polarization of the membrane and shuts off that transmission of that electrical signal. So that's the off signal. So if you increase the amount of potassium flowing out of the nerve fiber, that increases the potency of the off signal and that can lead to blocking of otherwise desirable signals moving down the nerve fibers, which then leads to conduction block and conduction delay. And that problem then causes the nervous system to dysfunction. That could be increased weakness. It could be a change in sensation. It could be a change in vision, leading from good vision to blurred vision. It can lead to increased neuropathic pain and a lot of other problems. So that susceptibility of these demyelinated nerve fibers to these very minor environmental changes causes MS symptoms to have symptoms that um, are worsening of their condition, but not necessarily due to active inflammation. So when we 
when patients have new symptoms or worsening symptoms, a major challenge for physicians and other healthcare providers is determining whether that's due to active inflammation in the brain or due to some other stress on previously damaged nerve fibers. So we use terms in MS called relapse or flares. So a true relapse or a true flare by definition is due to active inflammation occurring in the nervous system. It means the MS is active and you're getting an inflammatory attack on the brain. That inflammatory attack will last a few months and then it'll terminate for reasons we don't understand. Then there may be some recovery. Then there are pseudo relapses or pseudo flares. And these are where symptoms are worsening, but it's not because there's new inflammation. It's not because there's new damage occurring in the nervous system. Rather it's due to there's some stress that's changing that microenvironment around these demyelinated axons or nerve fibers that leads to them having more short circuiting and more conduction block and conduction delay. So distinguish between these is not easy. And again, remember that most inflammatory events that occur in the brain are clinically silent. 90 to 95% of new inflammatory foci in the brain or areas of inflammation are not associated with symptoms that either the patient or the physicians recognize. We only see them when we do MRIs, but they are damaging the nervous system. So there is this capacity of the nervous system to buffer for the inflammation. And that means that it's sometimes very difficult to tell whether a new symptom is due to inflammation or due to environmental change, mainly because it doesn't localize, it's not crisply defined, or it doesn't have other characteristics that we tend to associate with focal areas of active inflammation. So um, MS patients are very susceptible to change in symptoms due to inflammation on one end of the spectrum, and then due to environmental changes, which means change in body temperature, change in weather, change in nutrition, and many factors which we don't understand that can cause worsening or improvement of symptoms. Now, the coronavirus vaccine is a little bit complicated. Um, so there are a number of things that happen in the body when you get a vaccination, and particularly a potent vaccination like are available for the coronavirus. Uh, these vaccines are probably more potent than most vaccines that we actually use. And they cause several things to happen. One is, is that the inflammation that's responding to the vaccine actually releases factors that cause the body temperature to go up. It may not go up to what we would consider a fever. So in medicine, we define fever as a temperature above 100.4 Fahrenheit. Uh, but normal temperature is around 98.6 in terms of core temperature. Oral temperatures and skin temperatures will be different depending on your environment but core temperature is right around 98.6. And uh, a simple rise to 99 to 99 and a half is enough to cause MS symptoms to worsen. The other thing that happens is that that inflammation is releasing a large number of factors that are called cytokines and chemokines into the bloodstream. And that causes other cells to begin to react and produce other molecules in the body that are mainly focused on defense. So defending the, the host, the individual, from damage by trying to limit the infection and, and control it. Those are interferons and other molecules and those things themselves may also impact neurological function. However, what we do not see is an activation of the immune attack on the brain. So the inflammation at the injection site for the vaccine doesn't spill over and cause inflammation in the brain. So it's not causing new damage, rather it's causing those pseudo relapses and pseudo flares by these biochemical changes and change in body temperature. And as a result, those symptoms will tend to last often less than 24 hours, although they can last somewhat longer depending on the nature of the insult. But then when they resolve, people return back to their baseline function. Whereas a new relapse will resolve, but often leave people with now new health, new symptoms and new disabilities. So pseudo relapses need to be managed and there are different things you can do. In the setting of the coronavirus vaccine, you can take Tylenol, which is two of the 325 milligram tablets every four hours for the first 24 to 48 hours after the vaccine to try to minimize that body temperature fluctuation. You can also use ibuprofen at a dose of 400 milligrams, which is two tablets uh, every six hours for the same 24 to 48 hours. You wanna stay well hydrated. Um, and, and then outside of that, I would say stay as active as you feel comfortable in doing. But again, at this point, we do not have any evidence that the coronavirus vaccines actually set off a new attack on the brain in MS due to active inflammation. And so managing those side effects of the vaccination may help you uh, have fewer symptoms, feel better, and recover more rapidly from the vaccines. Thank you.